So I remember reading Chuck D's book, and he talked about how how Flavor Flav was always kind of a loose cannon mm -hmm. in the group. And um, I think there was this one part in the book where Flav showed up like really, really late to a meeting, and you ended up kicking him in the chest. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, man, but no. That's not the way the story went. We're, <laughs> we're supposed to do a gig, and we were looking for flavor. And where we lived, Roosevelt, okay. Freeport, Hempstead, it's not that big. So there's only a few places that he could have been. So I put the word out, and I got 20 people looking for this dude. And it's like, I know where he at, Bricktown in Freeport. Take my crew. We go to Bricktown, you got drug dealers, thugs, and all these other kind of people thinking they fucking tough. But nah, dudes, you ain't that fucking tough. Move the fuck out the way. We found Flavor up on the roof, getting lit, put him in the car, brought him to the studio, asked him was he ready to go, end up trying to curse me out. And you remember them big boom boxes? He used to carry that all the damn time. And he had to shit on 15. Listening to some whack ass fucking song he probably made. Now I'm only playing. But anyway, he took it off his shoulder and he put it here. And I kicked the box. I wasn't kicking him. But, you know, okay. being angry and mean and kind of, you know, aggressive. You understand what I'm saying? End up kicking him in the chest and whatever, whatever, whatever. So subsequently he didn't want to go because he thought I was a little bit too violent. And I just was basically asking him and everybody else, either we're going to do this shit or we're not. Plain and simple. You understand? And I think at that time became the unraveling of public enemies as far as Professor Griffith is concerned because simply put, and I was like, Flavor, I can't fight you and them and deal with our people in the street. I'm trying to hold this together. You going to work with us or what? Nah, man. The drug was more important. Right, because, and I remember I, I, had, I had read an interview with Flav talking about this. When you guys did Night of the Living Bassheads, the, the music video, which I thought was, was brilliant. Like artistically, the way that that video yeah. was put together was, was just yeah. on a different level from anything you've ever seen in a music video before. Right. But I guess Flav, Flav was talking about that when they were filming that video, he was actually smoking crack during yeah, the time. Right. So you have this, this anti-crack song that Flav is in, but he's actually smoking crack during the filming of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like um, A, being a shame, but when we look at the history of black artists in the music industry, that whole drug element and ingredient was always there. Look at jazz. You understand what I'm saying? Look at, you know, the yeah. artists that came up in R&B. That element was always there. So, you know, we're not above and beyond it, even with a positive, conscious group like Public Enemy. But what we tried to do and attempted to do was hide it. It's like that problem that your wife or your girlfriend or your brother may have, and the family kind of shields it away until they can get his act together. You understand what I'm saying? But that caused friction between me and Flavor because you're talking about a man like Professor Griff training martial arts, teaching others, other people and other students, having a crew of about 50 people. You understand what I'm saying? Ready to move on my word. No drugs, no alcohol, damn near no soda, no meat, vegetarians, thinking positive, and then Flavor come along, come on, on crack? Now, we can't let the world know that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that dynamic was always there. And, when, and, so, and Chuck wasn't no social scientist. He did not keep, you know, Chuck Flavor at, Flavor at bay and Griff at bay. You understand? And I do have to admit, and I've, and I've admitted it over the years, there's, different, there's a very uh, mature way, a much more mature way I could have handled the situation. But you're thinking this shit was supposed to last two years. We got a window of opportunity. Make it happen. And I'm not going to lose this on trying to get to the people because this dude is on crack. You understand? But you got to understand something. Prior to that, me and my crew was robbing drug dealers. You understand? We didn't give a fuck about that life or them. You were standing in our way. You understand what I'm saying? And either you're going to be part of the problem or the solution. What you going to do?
with, with, I mean, with those issues, Flay was just a very, very integral part of the group. Like, I can't really imagine public, you know, I, I feel there is no public enemy without Flay. And, and I would agree. And I would there agree. There is with no you. public enemy without, yeah. Right, I, I yeah. would agree. I with mean, you. Like, like the, the ad libs and, and what Flav brings to the equation can't be duplicated. You can't swap them out with another hype man or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but you could say that about any integral part of Public Enemy. You, you, you could say that about the Bomb Squad. Right. You could say that about the mystique of a man, Terminator X, who never spoke. Right. You, you could say that about Professor Griff and the S1Ws. It's like... Are you just two rappers right. and a DJ on stage, or? But all of it made Public Enemy what it is. You understand what I'm saying? So, Nation of Millions comes out and it it goes crazy. Like, how many albums did it end up selling? I don't enough for us to get sued, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah. <laughs> okay. So so Nation of Millions comes out. You know, considered I think it was two by, million. by okay two million. So it goes multi-platinum. Not only does it sell a lot of copies, but it's critically acclaimed. It's not, it's not just a pop album. This was no Ice Ice Baby. This was a critically right. acclaimed hip-hop masterpiece. So everything just kind of goes crazy after that. Like what, what really changed in the group once you had such a huge hit on your hands? The number one thing, how to handle that. <laughs> Yeah. How do you handle, and this is no, please, there's no disrespect to anyone. How do you handle living in Roosevelt, one square mile, all black, except how, except how it stirs, white ass. But how do you handle that coming out of Roosevelt? Now you're public enemy. You at the concert opening up before the Beastie Boys, 20,000 people in the audience. 99.9% .9 all fucking white, and you say put your fist in the air. How the fuck you handle that? Hmm. That's culture shock, man. You understand what I'm saying? Most of us ain't never left Roosevelt or Long Island, other than going into the city to Queens and Brooklyn and Bronx. So how do you handle that? Now you in front of 20,000 people, mostly white? We had very limited interaction with white people. The fucking landlord, the dude on the liquor store, and the laundromat. So come on, man. That's that's culture shock. Right, because at one point, uh, Public Enemy was opening up for U2 at the height of U2. Yeah, but that was later so on. It, later on, but it, yeah, but what I'm saying is, is that you guys are a pro-black group with these huge white stadiums, essentially. Yeah, yeah but people, people. <laughs> thought that pro-black meant anti-white, and it don't. Yeah. yeah. If, 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 I, if I love Griff, I'm capable of loving anyone else. But if I don't love yeah. me, I'm, it's incapable, I'm incapable of loving anyone else because I don't love myself. We said, let's love self first. Not that we made the music and catered it towards a certain specific group of people. It was for everyone. Music is a universal language. Some of the struggles and some of the things and topics that we dealt with on the albums they, of course they were meant for white people. Shit. When we said she watched Channel Zero, black women weren't the only ones watching soap operas. Hmm. You understand? Light and living basis. Black people weren't the only ones on crack. I know some white crackheads. Shit. 